Hello folks, welcome to another SACPA session. SACPA's, SACPA acknowledges that this event takes place on the lands of the Blackfoot people and the Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3. And we pay respect to their past, present and future cultural heritage, beliefs and relationship to the land. SACPA is very thankful for the continuing support we receive from the University of Lethbridge, Shaw Spotlight and the Lethbridge Herald. Today, we're very happy to welcome uh, Leia Otto Benson, Deputy Director on Impact and Learning at the Stephen Lewis Foundation. Uh, the Stephen Lewis Foundation is a progressive feminist organization rooted in the principles of social justice, international solidarity, and substantive equality. The Stephen Lewis Foundation was created with the express purpose of supporting community-based organizations working on the front lines of the AIDS pandemic in Sub-Saharan Africa. Many of these grassroots organizations were organized, were originally formed by small groups of individuals responding to the crisis of AIDS that had wrought in their own lives and in the lives of their neighbors. Over the years, they have developed into a thriving local institution or institutions with deep connections to their communities. The Stephen Lewis Foundation community-based partners are turning the tide of HIV and AIDS by providing care and support to women, orphan children, LGBTQI individuals, grandmothers, and people living with HIV and AIDS. Thank you so much for joining us today, Leia, and look forward very much to your presentation. Thank you so much for having me. It's lovely to be here with you and thank you for that lovely introduction. Um, again, my name is Leah and I'm calling in from Ottawa, which is the unceded territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe. Um, I'm in Ottawa, the foundation itself is actually in Toronto. So I'm gonna just start this presentation by just talking a little bit about who we are as a foundation, because who we are matters. It's core to our values and the way that we work as an organization. Um, so if we could just go on to the next slide, that'd be great. <laughs> Thanks. So, thank you. So about us, we were created in 2003 with the expressed purpose of supporting community-based organizations working on the front lines of AIDS in Sub-Saharan Africa. And uh, our founder, Stephen Lewis, you know, when he was a special envoy at the height of the HIV and AIDS pandemic, he was a special envoy uh, for UN AIDS and he would go out to sub-Saharan Africa and realize the people doing the work weren't receiving the funds. Uh, the people at the front lines weren't receiving the necessary funds or recognition for the work that they were doing uh, to cut HIV and AIDS off at the root. Um, and so he and his daughter Ilana started the foundation in 2003 and it's grown tremendously since then. We're now an organization of about 30 uh, and why, you know, why were, <laughs> were these uh, organizations not getting the funds? Because of geopolitics and racism, essentially. Um, funding just was not making it directly into the hands of those actually doing the work on the ground. And there's a lot of geopolitics wrapped up in that, um, especially in conversations around Africa and African context. Uh, a lot of conversations around colonialism and colonial, colonial understandings of uh, the work that was happening in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, where funds were being uh, shared, they were really prescriptive and restrictive. Uh, they weren't flexible. Uh, and both Stephen and Alana had a really deep understanding that positive and lasting change can really only happen through solidarity. Not through charity, but through meaningful solidarity with those most affected uh, at the community level. And the community-based organizations were the ones who knew these people the best not the intermediary in NGOs, uh, but the community-based organizations. So next slide. So we have 121 project partners in 15 countries. And as we mentioned before, we're working with children and adolescents, grandmothers. Um, I know, I hope many of you are familiar with the grandmothers movement, um, you know, in terms of how iterative the foundation has been in understanding uh, the needs on the ground. You know, when the foundation first started, we would get all these uh, requests coming in and these 
these narrative reports about the caretakers, the caretakers, the caretakers. And when we dug a little bit deeper, we realized that the caretakers <laughs> were grandmothers. Uh, there were grandmothers who were caring for the children that were left behind when their parents died of HIV and AIDS, a whole generation essentially wiped out. Grandmothers who were, you know, in the prime of their lives, coping with their own grief and loss, and also now expected uh, in their years to care and provide for young children. Um, we also work in the area of home-based care, uh, which is an evolving uh, form of community-based care. Uh, in positive living, living, which essentially is, you know, working in issues around stigma and discrimination and advocating, um, ending violence against women, and most recently LGBTIQ health and human rights. We have 16 LGBTIQ partners we work with across Uganda, uh, Kenya, and uh, um, Tanzania. Next slide. So who are we? This is uh, shared a bit, so I'm not going to go over this in any great detail, but I want to share that, again, who we are matters in terms of the work that we do and how we do it. Uh, we have strong values of anti-oppression and anti-colonialism. We have a partnership model that's really infused into the fabric of our day-to-day -day work, and we acknowledge the power that we have as a funder sitting in an office in Toronto and the imbalance that creates right when you are supporting community-based organizations and so we really try to develop and work with models that disrupt the legacies of racism and structural inequality that exist in international development now which means essentially that we don't have projects <laughs> we don't run programs um, we're very much guided by the work that's happening that the partners are doing on the ground express needs of the partners um, and really building relationships that are essentially made of trust and mutual respect that are long term. And so a bit more about who we are. Uh, again, we're firmly, we firmly believe that the expertise comes from the community-based partners. We don't know what's happening in the sense that we're not, we're not there, you know, there's that saying who feels it knows it. And we really believe that about the context of this work. Uh, those most affected know best what the solutions are uh, for their day-to-day -day realities and challenges. It's not prescriptive or impositional, but it honors and respects uh, partners' autonomy and decision-making. So essentially, we don't you know, instruct partners on what they should be doing and how they should be doing it and what the organization should look like. And we don't you know, kind of go in with any of those kind of prerequisites. We have a strong belief in organizations' power to create meaningful changes for themselves and be self-directed. Uh, and to walk with them over the continuum of that journey, uh, you know, it's their highs and lows and in-betweens <laughs> organizations, um, just like, you know, all of us. And so we kind of walk with them along that continuum. And so many partners we've had for 12, you know, plus years, 13 years, uh, we've been working with partners and we've really seen them grow from strength to strength, from very small organizations with sustained support over years, becoming much bigger organizations and very self-sustaining. Um, and then again, we develop relationships that are flexible. Our funding is extremely flexible um, and it's based on the express needs and the priorities of the partners. So next slide. Uh, and then again, this is uh, more about, you know, who we are. So we can, I think the long-term piece is the piece that I really wanna get across here and that, you know, we don't believe that sustainability comes from <laughs> funding a one-off project. This work is long-term. Uh, it requires long-term commitment. It's not a linear journey in terms of models of success. Uh, there are ebbs and flows and highs and lows for both the organization and the impact that they're able to have based on country context. Uh, COVID has been a very good example of that. Um, and it requires a relationship that's based on patience, perseverance, commitment, authenticity, understanding, and reliable funding. Um, and that's flexible funding as well which supports core costs for organizations, things like salaries and rent. Um, partners cannot do this work meaningfully if their core costs are not supported. And one of the biggest challenges, I think, in, the, you know, in HIV and AIDS funding as it exists to date is that people are very willing to fund projects, uh, you know, because projects very, look very good, but they're not willing to fund salaries or rent. Uh, or utilities, those things that keep organizations running from the day to day. And why does any of this matter? I mean, you know, we've come a long way 
there's been momentous progress uh, in the number of people that have been on treatment. Antiretrovirals are now much more readily available than they were in the early days. But inequalities still persist. And six, in a, six out of seven new infections among adolescent girls are in, are in the sub-Saharan region. Um, Gender-based violence continues to be very real. Um, and inequalities in terms of accessing resources, uh, accessing health services, accessing spaces that are stigma and discrimination free in the context of folks living with um, folks who are identify as LGBTIQ is extremely difficult in the countries in which our partners work. Um, many of our LGBTIQ partners work in contexts where um, the law does not support them um, and their rights. Uh, and so, you know, there's much to contend with in the context of inequalities and how that exasperates and exaggerates uh, the context in which partners live in. Um, and then also, for the vast majority of people living with HIV and AIDS reside in low and middle income countries, and yet the funding to those countries has decreased um, over the years, which is, you know, increasingly a problem. Um, and again, I kind of touched on this already, that when funding is available, it's just not making it into the hands of community's organization, and it's too often constrained uh, in ways that limit the effectiveness of the funds and limit the, the effectiveness of people able to deliver those funds in meaningful ways. So next slide. And then, you know, we've been kind of touting this line for a really long time now about the importance of community-based organizations um, and finally, we feel like the international community is, is kind of caught on to this, UNAIDS, uh, you know, other uh, facilities of the United Nations, recognizing wholeheartedly that all of the progress made has been because of many, much of the progress made in the U.S. because of community-based organizations doing the work on the ground, people who uh, have close personal relationships and close professional relationships to their clients and to the beneficiaries people who the beneficiaries trust, um, people who know the context of their communities um, and are able to develop and devise programming that aligns with that context uh, and is agile enough to adapt when that context changes. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're really proud to say that, you know, finally we feel like the international community has got on, though that is not met by increased funding. So there is the disconnect. Okay. Uh, and so why do we believe in investing in CBOs? Again, we believe that health, healthy community-based organizations are essential for building strong and resilient communities. That CBOs know their communities best. They are of the community, for the community. Many of the organizations we work with started out of necessity. You know, I mean, you have organizations that were started by a teacher uh, who recognized a particular need in his community around adolescents and orphans and vulnerable children in terms of not accessing school and decided to, to do something about it. You know, we have LGBTIQ activists who decided to do something about it. And so, you know, most of the organizations and many of the organizations were started out of necessity that were started in community and they just grew and grew because the need was so great. And I think there's a lot of merit to that kind of approach <laughs> and understanding that comes when you know, organizations are not just in community, but of community. <laughs> Um, that are made up of community members, kind of active engagement of uh, people living with an effective HIV and AIDS. They develop uh, deep and lasting connections with their clients. There's a level of trust that is built because of this continuation of the work over time. Um, and they're in tune with their community's needs. And I'll tell you a little bit of why that is in the next slide. And I think it's you know because community-based organizations provide a continuum of care that is so difficult for other, you know, institutions to do. So they recognize the intersections of people's lives. We're not just one identity. We make up multiple identities. We have multiple needs. And when we think about the social determinants of health and all the things that impinge and impact upon us accessing meaningful health, there's so many pieces of that, right? And so because community-based organizations are focused on a human-centered approach, they can make the referrals. They can, you know, assess the situation. They can treat the whole person. You know, it's very difficult to go on antiretroviral medication if you're not accessing food, if you're not meaningfully employed. Um, you know, it's very hard to advocate for your rights if you don't have the necessary psychosocial support services. 
um, that can you know or to adhere to your to your um, antiretroviral treatment if you are not working with peers who can motivate you to yeah, and support you. So I think it's this kind of wraparound approach to doing the work uh, that makes it especially meaningful and it's very unique. And I know that in, you know we talk about the social determinants of health all the time, but this is the way that community based organizations have been working for a really long time. That you know the, the whole person matters. You're not some pieces of you're in this case your HIV needs status. That you are many other things, and these things matter, and they matter to the organization that is supporting you. I also will say that you know the other piece that that really kind of speaks. To me, is that people exist in families, and another thing that community-based organ and, and, commu and communities, but you know, in family, and so community-based organizations are actually able to uh, assess the needs of the family as well, because it's very difficult to work with one person um, in a very specific context, you know, and through things like home-based care, which is the the next slide, um, which is a program area that our partners have worked in for a very long time. Uh, community-based organizations can assess the need of the family. <laughs> and so, you know, home-based care has evolved over the duration of the HIV and AIDS pandemic. Um, now it really is about meeting people where they're at in terms of their access to health. In the context of Sub-Saharan Africa, it's a very geographically spread place. Uh, you know, 13 of um, the 15 countries that we work with, I think there's fewer than three doctors for under, you know, every 10,000 people. So access to kind of medical facilities is just not feasible or realistic. Uh, the cost of transport is prohibitive. There's still a lot of dis stigma and discrimination that exists in national health facilities. And so community-based organizations have set up, you know, home-based care, essentially, community-based care settings where community members can feel safe, accommodated, and where the needs of the whole family are adjusted and, and, and spoken about. Right, so you can go into the home and, and understand if there's a context of gender-based violence that's happening, that's preventing someone from access, you know, from from adhering to their antiretroviral treatment, or preventing a child from going to school. I think that the merits of home-based care as an approach have been significantly underrated by the HIV and AIDS response. Home-based caregivers are so essential to supporting those living with HIV and AIDS in their journey. Um, in their life journey and walking with them along that continuum. Um, and so this is an example of kind of one of the areas that some of our partners work in um, that we are continuing to highlight across the organization because we've recognized how, you know, I would say, you know, 60% of our partners work in this way, if, you know, if not home-based care in a community-based setting. And the referrals that they're able to make to mainstream health facilities and the connections they're able to bridge um, and the way they're able to bring people into the healthcare setting um, through this kind of one-on-one -on -one support cannot be overrated or overstated. Um, and so this is an example of a home-based care worker, you know, and many of these these folks are volunteers, which is the other travesty, right, is that, and many of them are women, right, and when you think about women's unpaid care responsibilities, um, gender roles and you know this is is inherently problematic right because the hiv and aids response is not compensating women for the work that they're doing in community building uh, especially in the context of home-based care work and many of these home-based care workers are essentially beneficiaries of the organization who came to the organization and who now want to continue this work and they're so critical to the work of the foundation and they essentially go into community um, to provide all these kind of routine vaccinations, monitoring ARV adherence and wellness, delivering food, uh, providing support to education and health, uh, postpartum support, bathing clients and delivering medicine. Um, you know, that's largely done by volunteers because, you know, small communities, they cannot afford to, to pay the salaries for these individuals. Um, and, you know, the foundation really, really believes wholeheartedly in advocating for flexible funding <laughs> So that you know that people can be compensated for the work that they are doing, uh, and that you know national governments actually recognize the essential role that community-based health workers play in the wider community-based healthcare setting and in the national response more specifically. Um, okay, and I, this is just a nice quote from one of our partners in Francis Healthcare Services. They are in Uganda. 
and it just says home-based care allows us to deliver comprehensive holistic care to the community when our home-based care team visits treatment for illness um, treatment for illness affecting the members of the household is done HIV testing is also done at the household level along with counseling psychosocial support hygiene support parenting dialogues to guide grandmothers with parenting challenges and child protection dialogues to support grandmothers through creating awareness on how to access services okay, next slide and grandmothers we spoke a little bit about grandmothers this is another one of our key programmatic areas um, because grandmothers are a movement uh, now across sub-Saharan Africa. They are advocating and lobbying for their rights, uh, their right to social services, their right to social supports. Um, they are a cornerstone in the HIV and AIDS uh, fight. Um, you know, they have been uh, supporting the care of a generation <laughs> of young people uh, over the years. Um, and so, and they've been supporting them, you know, while going through their own grief. Uh, they've been supporting them with parenting assistance. They've been in community-based organizations with with leadership training with income generation. And now grandmothers are at the forefront of lobbying for their own rights. Uh, so we have a, a you know, organization. The foundation works with grandmothers in Canada to support grandmothers. It's called the Grandmothers to Grandmothers Campaign. Um, I'm not sure if you know, some folks in the room are familiar with that work, but it really is again about solidarity and an understanding of the needs of grandmothers <laughs> um, and uh, a recognition for the incredible role that grandmothers play um, in supporting communities and being leaders in their communities and passing the institutional knowledge and the generational knowledge that has uh, created robust and resilient communities over time. So this is a very important programmatic area for the foundation because many of the beneficiaries of the work that the partners are doing are grandmothers um, who are taking care of orphans and vulnerable children who are having to provide school fees who are all doing all of these these things um, and they've really become active agents of change in their own destiny in their own journey um, we continue to build and support the grandmothers movements across um, sub-saharan africa and this is a uh, Ms. Mumba at Cindy, uh, she is a grandmother, uh, and this little quote says, I am what I am now because of the Grandmothers Network and the support I received from Cindy. I am amazed that there are people out there who are concerned about people who are vulnerable. Uh, and yeah, Krissa is a, she's a widow with four grandchildren and six children of her own, and she uh, is supported by income generating activities. She went through an income generation training to figure out how she could be economically empowered to run her own business. Uh, and so, so through Cindy, she's able to do that. And that then facilitates her ability to support her grandchildren and her children um, and diverts feelings of isolation that evolve when you can be part of a network of grandmothers doing this work, of peers who can support you, who understand you, who um, know about the challenges that you're experiencing. She's joined a women's club. Uh, you know, so these are the kind of networking pieces, the community pieces that are so essential to people's well-being, especially, you know, as you get older and older. And so COVID-19. COVID is, uh, I mean, I know we've all, uh, in many ways, differential ways, but in many ways been affected by COVID-19. Um, I know in Alberta right now you have a, a current spike in cases. Um, which is putting a tremendous pressure on health facilities. So imagine when you have a population in Sub-Saharan Africa, which is the case of one billion, <laughs> the incredible strain that COVID has, you know, has brought on national health responses, again, can be overstated. Um, health systems have been incredibly stretched. And then when you think about vaccine access and the challenges that many countries in sub-Saharan Africa have had in terms of accessing vaccines, you can see how the situation is compounded. Um, I mean, you know, African Center for Disease Control and Prevention aims to vaccinate 60% of the African continent by the end of 2022, which is more than a year and a half after similar targets reached in many other parts of the world. Uh, vaccine inequity is huge. And when you compound that with dual pandemics, you can only imagine how challenging that has been for the partners. Um, you know, in terms of 
physical disruptions. It's disrupted people's access to HIV treatment and prevention commodities. I mean, transportation costs went up. Uh, physically getting to um, to facilities to access ARVs became very, very challenging. Um, it reduced testing and delayed HIV treatment initiation, interrupted uptake and consistent access to PrEP, which is a pre-exposure prophylaxis. I mean, the isolation created by lockdowns also led to an increase in gender-based violence and discrimination. Um, this was particularly evident for some of the LGBTQ organizations that we work with, you know, it's really challenging in, in that context where you live and work with your chosen family and then you're in lockdown and you have to go back to your family who may not necessarily be as supportive um, as needed in the communities that may not be as supportive as needed. And so, you know, many folks really suffered <laughs> tremendous challenges in the context of lockdown, the isolation, the violence that incurred when your home is not your safest space. You know, the thing with lockdown is it infers that your home is a safe space. And for many people, that is not the case. Um, there was a decreased access to income generating opportunities, which so many rely upon. Um, you know, for grandmothers, you know, who were selling goods and services in markets, this was not, you know, an option for a very long time. Uh, school closures, you know, I think Uganda just went back to school recently. Uh, and school is more than just a physical space, right? School is access to meals, it's access to safe, safe spaces for children. And I was reading a report recently from one of our partners and there was a line in there that said, you know, children were falling pregnant in the context of being away from school. <laughs> and there's so much you can, you can read into that, but it's, the challenge is extremely real. And so this is a quote from Ishtar MSN, one of our LGBTIQ organizations, uh, which spoke to their present context in COVID. Uh, people use sex, alcohol, and drugs to cope with the stress. He also saw that HIV positive clients were struggling to adhere to ARTs when job losses made it impossible to put food on the table. Someone would say, what's the point of taking medication when I can't eat? Uh, quite a number of them kind of lost direction. And so, you know, organizations like Ishtar and the staff at Ishtar really put themselves at tremendous risk to keep their wellness center open, recognizing that safe spaces, uh, safe community spaces are so critical to the health and well-being of their beneficiaries. Uh, and um, they kept those safe spaces running and operating, hotlines, phones, uh, any kind of access that they could continue to have to their beneficiaries during this very difficult time. Um, and this flexibility that we have as a foundation allowed them to pay for things that they wouldn't have thought they needed to pay for in the context of COVID. But, uh, you know, the reality is as well, and I know that I'm wrapping up on time really quickly, so I'm going to try and, try and speed through. Um, the partners were built, the partners that we work with were built in the context of pandemic. And so one of the things that we kind of realized so they were super agile in pivoting to meet the needs of the community because this was a reality. This is a dual pandemic. You're talking about organizations who were built in the very early days of HIV and AIDS. Uh, and so they were able to really pivot their programs and services to meet their community's needs. And that, that included a, you know, support to immediate needs. So food, sanitizer, masks, adjusting their programs and services to more accessible online components, um, strengthening their community-based care systems, and psychosocial support. And they became really, and continue to be con really relied on by governments for a vaccine rollout and COVID sensitization and basic care. So, you know, many of our partners were physically shuttling beneficiaries to, to vaccine centers, to testing centers. Um, and the government, I think, has come to rely on them extremely heavily for their reach, <laughs> for their ability to reach the most marginalized and most vulnerable in those communities. Um, you know, where, you know, traditional services fail, essentially. Uh, and so the SLF support has been, you know, to these organizations in the context of COVID has been through additional funds. We've provided additional funds to all of our partners. The flexible funding that we have makes it very easy for partners to adjust. They could say to us, this is not happening. <laughs> They're not locked in, you know, they could say, this is not happening. This has changed for us. We need to use the funds for this. And it's a very straightforward and easy process. They're not locked into a log frame or a logic model or any of those kind of somewhat constricting ways of doing this work. Um, we just provided a lot of space 
for them to adjust the new realities of this work, which was just giving space and holding space for, for folks, you know, without expectation. Uh, we moved all of our m &E to virtual and we just kind of maintain an ongoing connection with all of our partners. And it's been a real, it's been a real journey. Um, and this is just kind of one of the things that our partners has, have done to kind of pivot their programming and services as a stepping stones international in Botswana. Um, again, recognizing that gender-based violence increased in COVID, you know, after lockdowns, these they mobilized grandmothers <laughs> to, um, to support them in identifying cases of GDB in the community and making the referrals that were needed. And grandmothers were able to reach some of the people that they just could not get to. And that is it. <laughs> That's, uh, that is us in a nutshell and some of the work that we do. And we hope you can continue this conversation uh, through our website as well, uh, stephenlewisfoundation.org. There's lots of information up there about who we are and what we do. Um, so thank you so very much. <laughs> and now I'm open to, to any questions that folks may have. Lovely. Thank you for your presentation. I'm going to jump right into the questions here. Um, our first uh, question comes from Beth Mundell Etherstone. You mentioned the shocking HIV AIDS infections and death in 15 to 18 year old girls in, and then in brackets, uh, was it Sub-Saharan Africa? Are these high rates contributed to by female genital mutilation? Um, yeah, that, that was a statistic from UNAIDS uh, in the context of Sub-Saharan Africa um, as a region. Um, you know, I don't want to suggest that that would be the situation. It's not something that I'm, female genital mutilation is something I'm super familiar with. What we do know is there's many other attributes, one of which is gender-based violence, uh, the other is, you know, very inequitable gender norms. Uh, yeah, the other is generational relationships. There are many, you know, contributing factors to why women and girls continue to be so vulnerable in the context of HIV and AIDS. Um, and a lot of that has to do essentially with the underpinnings of gender inequality, right? Negotiating safe sex uh, can be very challenging in intergenerational relationships. Access to sexually reproductive health uh, education and services about how to prevent uh, HIV and AIDS is also challenging. Um, and so there's many kind of contributing factors that compound that issue, but all based on, this is essentially based on inequality, right? Um, and, and gender roles and responsibilities. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, next question again from Bethman Atherston. We have a very active this is more a comment, I think. We have a very active Harambi grandmothers group in Lethbridge who raise funds for grandmothers in Africa through the Stephen Lewis Foundation. So it's a plug. That's great. Thank you so much for everything that you are doing. Um, you know, the grandmothers are a tremendous force. We are always super grateful uh, to be able to support and to, to learn from. Next question comes from Ian Hurdle. Have these uh, community-based organizations been able to bypass the at times national reluctance for HIV drugs to gain access to low cost generic drugs? I mean, it's a really good, a really good question. I think that many of, I don't, I don't want to speak out of turn, but I think a lot of the ARB, I can't speak to medications, but are, are generic medications which has driven the cost down right like it's um but they do work with national governments to access antiretrovirals it's a part of national strategic plans around hiv and aids to provide those 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 things for their countries um so national governments i think continue to be uh, the place and have a responsibility because of public health to provide these medications uh, and communities organizations work with them in support of distribution and adherence um, because it's one thing to provide medication, it's quite another thing to take it for the rest of your life. And so, you know, that disconnect is where CBOs really come into play in, the, in that they support folks in not just taking the medications, but understanding what that looks like at all the various stages of your life. I mean, can you imagine being a young person 
and having to manage that that process. And luckily, you know, community-based organizations are there to support with peer mentorship and peer support. Um, you know, in support of um, folks continuing that that ARV journey because that's what it is. Um, you know, yeah. it's much about behavior as it is about a, a medication. You know. Our next question comes from Mark Goodall. Have attitudes re safe sex changed since antiviral drugs have become more available and death rates due to AIDS reduced? That seems to be what has been happening in the West. Has behavior changed? Is that yeah. the question? Yeah. Have attitudes re safe sex changed since antiviral drugs have become more available and death rates due to AIDS have been reduced? That seems to be, Mark seems to think that that's the case in the West. So has yeah, that I mean, I mean, it's hard to speak to that because, you know, there, it, Sub-Saharan Africa is not a homogenous place. It's, it's made up of various countries with very specific national contexts. Um, very different economies and political contexts, and those things have an impact on people's lives, um, conditions in which they live, whether you know have an impact on their lives. And so, you know, maybe knowledge, knowledge, attitudes, and practices have been shifting over the years, but there's still some very discriminatory practices and attitudes that that remain and you know and persist. Um, many of them are around gender. <laughs> And, uh, and inequality, um, and and that you know affects access <laughs> um, to to resources, to economic uh, resources, to social resources, and so when these things compound, it, it becomes less about just your knowledge about HIV and AIDS and navigating all of the other obstacles that you face in very challenging context, uh, especially if you are. Uh, living in economic hardship, uh, there's challenges to reconcile there. If you are in a context where there is extreme gender inequality in terms of your role in society, and that is not the case across the board, but you know there are some context. Uh, religion <laughs> plays a very interesting role in some context um, about attitudes and beliefs about sexuality and, and sexual health. Um, so I think it's a very complex conversation, and I think, you know, the, there's always that disconnect between knowledge and practice, and I think that's again the the where the the gray area is. You can know a lot, <laughs> but there's certain things that may impede your ability to practice your, you know, and and, and act out and play out the knowledge that you you glean or, or gather. And so, yeah, I think that's that's a hard answer that question. Uh, next question, uh, Bav Mundo. Is the myth that having sex with a virgin will get rid of HIV AIDS still prevalent? If so, how is the public education carried out? How is public education carried out by Stephen Lewis Foundation or not? I mean, I don't know if that's a specific myth or if that kind of gained popularity in the Western media in terms of the, the perspective on on Africa and why there's a spread of HIV and AIDS. I mean, I think it may be a, I mean, it, it can, it's hard to generalize really in terms of that specific thing. I think that again, there exist in many areas of the world, but in many communities, Africa is no exception and the countries that exist there are no exception. Myths and misconceptions uh, around HIV and AIDS, many of those myths and misconceptions I wouldn't say that they no longer exist, but because of the work of community-based partners and all of the tremendous progress that's been made, we are very clear about the medical uh, aspects of HIV and AIDS. We're very clear on how you, you can contract HIV um, and, and what you know you can do to prevent HIV and what you cannot do to prevent HIV. So I think that these kind of HIV 101, as I'd like to call them, um, you know, that information is, is more readily available, more easily accessible um, through community-based partners. And I think that there is a, probably a more of a sense about uh, the kind of biomedical aspects of HIV, right? Um, I think, again, that gets blurred around um, a particular cultural context. Um, 
and uh, kind of localized context. And those differ from place to place. So it's really hard to generalize about one specific misconception because it may not exist across the board. And it, um, but we know <laughs> that they exist. So the myths and misconceptions about sex and sexuality um, continue to exist. <laughs> so. Laurie Schultz, I understand some of the home-based care partner programs were very effective. Some were providing training for home-based care workers as well as their wages. Is this continuing? Yes, I mean, you know, home-based care has become so much more expansive. It's a, essentially a part of wider community-based care systems. And so, you know, mo many of the partners that we work with, I'd say the vast majority, have some component of community-based healthcare built into the work that they are doing. Whether that be, you know, coming to their centers or physically going out into the community to do this work. And so, yeah, we continue to support this work because it's so key for so many different reasons. Um, and I'll say, especially in the context of, of now COVID, I think like going into folks' homes and their places of comfort has been a real eye-opener in terms of understanding what's happening in the family um, that may be affecting individuals. And so I think that this work continues to be really powerful um, because it is that human connection <laughs> piece that really is the heart of this work, forging meaningful connections with other people <laughs> and building that trust with other people so that people can feel comfortable and confident. Um, in you and in your, your intentions uh, and can have a better understanding of some of the support systems that are there to facilitate their health and wellness. Um, so yeah, we continue to support this work 100%. Uh, next question comes from Knut Peterson. Thank you. Thanks very much for your presentation. Is there evidence that HIV AIDS infected persons are particularly at risk from COVID infection, more so than others that are immune compromised? Um, I don't want to speak on it. I don't have that information. It's not something that I've been made aware of, if it is the case. Um, so I don't know if I can answer that question meaningfully. I don't think it's, it's something that I've been made aware of. Uh, next question comes from Laura Schultz. Have the African governments taken any effective initiatives regarding sexual violence? And then in brackets, education, justice, etc. Yeah, I mean, again, that's um, a huge question because, you know, across the 15 countries that we work with, the context, the political context is all very different. I want to say, you know, that, you know, Many countries have bought into things like CEDAW, Conventional Elimination of Discrimination Against All Forms of Violence Against Women. And so there is an obligation uh, and a responsibility and a legal responsibility for governments to have um, policies and practices in place that support ending violence against women, um, whether that be through the legal system uh, and the justice system um protection orders i mean those kind of things but i mean how it plays out in real time is always is always very different and i think you know um i just think it probably really differs from place to place i want to believe in best intent <laughs> and that you know that there are a lot of good people try to do a lot of really positive things um but when the need is great the challenges are, are immense mm -hmm. so i think you know the role that community-based organization play is really kind of stepping up and filling some of those gaps and the hope that is that you know these kind of gaps get smaller and smaller and shorter and shorter over time but you know i think that's the role that community-based organizations have a vested place um in is filling the gaps that are this kind of are left in, in in a response in a national response Um, Beth Mundo, in which countries are you seeing hope for more gender role equity? I would say, you know, that's a, again, a big question, but I feel like in all of the countries that we work, because of the work of our partners, there's been, you know, tremendous process, progress, you know, and when I share this presentation, I don't want her to think that there's not been tremendous progress in many of these areas. Um, 
because I think that the role that community-based organizations have played is, is that public education, is that psychosocial support, uh, is access to legal redress, um, you know, access to paralegals. I mean, the list goes on and on in terms of the roles that community-based organizations have played in kind of supporting um, better understanding of gender equality, equality and inequality, uh, what constitutes to it and how you can work towards greater gender equality in your families, in your communities, uh, at civil society levels. I think that there's been tremendous progress, especially as it relates to the role of women <laughs> in these spaces. And no more is it more evident than when you look at some of the communities that we work with and who is there doing the work. Um, so there's been tremendous progress, but you know, there's still much to be done. That doesn't just exist in sub-Saharan Africa that exists across the world in early women's rights and women's access um, to equal pay, <laughs> to be free of violence. In the case of Canada, when murdered and missing Indigenous women, do you know? So uh, yeah, I think that we all have, in every country of the world, there's a lot of work yet to be done um, in this regard. <laughs> Again, it's about, you know, yeah. <laughs> Laurie Schultz, what strategies or campaigns is the Stephen Lewis Foundation using to bring the realities of HIV and its impacts on generations of families in Africa to the other countries? To the other countries across the world, you mean? Yeah. So, uh, yeah. what strategies or campaigns is the Stephen Lewis Foundation using to bring the reality of HIV and its impacts on generations of families in Africa to the other countries? I'm assuming. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Laurie. Yeah. No, I, I think I understand. Thanks for the question. Yeah. Um, you know, we are we putting up quite a lot of information at the moment, actually, and you know, one of the exciting bits of my role, actually, which is new. Um, I've been in a few roles at the foundation, is really translating the learning that's coming from the partners and sharing that with our international community more meaningfully so that you can see the work of the partners more meaningfully. We're really excited to have that process kind of under, underway. It's a big part of our new strategic plan as well. So yeah, I think we are continuing to work to amplify the voices of the partners. Again, we're not taking ownership of this work, but we, this is partners' work. We want partners' voices to shine through. Um, and so we're continuing to have initiatives around amplifying partners' work, amplifying their voices in this space, um, talking about the things that matter to them, being able to answer some of these questions that are specific to country context that only they can answer, right? Um, and so you know, we're continuing as a foundation to prioritize that uh, through our campaigns, um, through our initiatives. We have a new person that's responsible for advocacy, so we're going to be taking more strategic and deliberate role in advocacy. Um, and so we're really excited about that. Um, next question comes from Mark Goddard. Does antiviral treatment in infected uh, pregnant women prevent acquisition of HIV in the unborn child? Yeah, and in terms of mother to child transmission, yeah, yeah, um, you know, mother. I think a lot of countries actually have done tremendously well. That's one of the areas that many countries have done tremendously well in, is in mother to child transmission of HIV, uh, and that is through you know the use of antiretroviral medication and catching um, HIV in its early stages. Um, and so I think there's obviously there's more supports that are required around that. But um, it's a big part of what our um, partners do. We have a partner in Lesotho called M2M, Mothers to Mothers. And it's primarily based on mothers um, reaching out to other mothers and mother, mother mentors, uh, supporting women living with HIV and AIDS who are, who are pregnant um, and understanding what that journey looks like for them. Uh, how to prevent their children from, from contracting HIV and AIDS, um, and how to kind of walk that, walk that journey. Yeah. Our next question comes from Knut Peterson. Given that most people around the world, irrespective of social status, 
have access to the internet and social media, have you seen a difference in more awareness this past couple of decades? More awareness of HIV and AIDS? And the, yeah, I would, I would probably say that there has been greater awareness. I would say that the, the conversation is not nearly around as much around awareness as it is around action. So many people are very aware of, of HIV and AIDS. They're very familiar with, you know, how to contract it, how to prevent it. Um, and again, a lot of those kind of biomedical aspects of HIV and AIDS are very well known. I think, you know, the what there's the, then there's the disconnect of when, you know, the as they say, when the rubber hits the road, right? What do how does knowledge translate into practice and behavior change? I think is um, an ongoing challenge in, in many, many aspects of, of work, <laughs> of our work. Um, and so, yeah, I would say that there's definitely increased awareness um, around it. Has that reduced stigma to some degree? Is there still discrimination? Yes. Um, do you know, is there particular social attitudes that exist still that are prevalent about people who are living with an affected by HIV? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, especially if you compound that with other components of people's lives, uh, whether they be the LGBTIQ or sex workers or injecting drug users. And so, you know, the stigma uh, and still exists around around those those spaces. And so, yeah, again, I think it's about this. It's more than knowledge, right? It's about um, it's about, yeah, it's more than knowing. It's just it's a being able to bridge the disconnect between knowing <laughs> and the practices that create enabling environments for folks, whether that be healthcare workers, uh, you know, making sure they're not discriminating against people living with HIV and AIDS and their knowledge about it and putting that knowledge into practice because of their own personal uh, value systems and belief systems. Mm -hmm. You know, this really is a personal belief and value systems thing. You can know a lot, but if you don't internalize that, <laughs> then it becomes a very different conversation. Our next question comes from Ian Hurrell. Even in our society, the grandmothers that are being parents seem to have the ability to tell persons selling false information or promises to get lost. I'm sure they, I'm sure they do even better under. In Africa. Maybe. <laughs> um, thanks for that question. Um, yeah, I think the grandmothers are uh, incredible. Of course, uh, you know, and they've created some really and continue to create really meaningful and lasting changes for themselves in terms of acknowledgement of everything they've done uh, in community um, and that they're continuing to do uh, in terms of lobbying for access to their rights, to land rights, to social protection, to pensions. <laughs> mm -hmm you know, to decent standards of life that can support them uh, and their caregiving responsibilities. That was our last question. Uh, okay. So before we wrap up the session, do you have a take home message for our viewers? Yeah, I think my take home message for everyone, and thank you so much for tuning in. It's, I really appreciate it being a part of this conversation with you, is that, you know, while tremendous progress has been made, there is still a lot of work to be done. And I think that countries across Sub-Saharan Africa continue to feel the inequality that larger global systems <laughs> continue to impose upon them. And this vaccine issue has been um, no different in terms of access to vaccines as it relates to COVID-19. And I think if some of these issues were happening somewhere else in the world, <laughs> there'd be a lot more attention, there'd be a lot more funding available uh, for this work. But for some reason, <laughs> uh, that's not the case. And I think we really need to unpack and explore why that is a bit more as a community, uh, uh, and, you know, and think about why that is and how, um, how we can support the work that's already happening on the ground and the folks who are doing this work uh, day in and day out. Um, for the good and betterment of their communities and the people that live in them. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for your presentation today um, and for joining us. And um, folks, for next week, I hope you'll join us for Dr. Paul Parks 
excess block, what is it? And what are the challenges facing the Alberta healthcare system? And um, thanks again, Leah, for Thank today. You. Thank you, everybody.